so much for the invitation um, to speak here today. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about sort of my conception of the workflow for single cell RNA-seq and attack, single cell attack seq data. And I'm just going to give you um, sort of like my, how I do it and what sort of tips and tricks around it. Anyway, I want to start off with um, sort of telling you how revolutionary single cell sequencing really is. And in order to really understand this, we have to go back to um, the start of sequencing. So in 1977, Frederick Sanger invented Sanger sequencing um, that allowed us to actually look at the genome or um, RNA, so DNA or RNA information for the first time. And this still required quite a lot of starting like material in order to do this. Actually, it required material for millions of cells. And since then, um, like there has obviously been quite a bit of um, uh, development. So in 2005, there was the introduction of next generation sequencing, which had already needed already significantly less uh, material. Um, so this was like from thousands of cells. But things really started to change in 2009 when Tang et al. came out with the first protocol for single cell sequencing. Albeit at that point, they only were able to do this for nine cells. Um, obviously, we're in a completely different era now. This has quite accelerated since 2009. At this point um, in 2017, when um, single cell sequencing was declared um, the technology of the year, um, we were already able to do this for millions of cells. And I'll go into this a little bit more. So single cell sequencing has also, um, has also, is also no longer exclu exclusively for transcriptome, which is where it started. So looking at the RNA, but now we are also able to look at the epigenome, so at methylation um, or at, at comatin, as well as um, the DNA. And really, really excitedly, we now also have um, combined protocols um, that look at sort of, um, for example, methylation and transcriptome at the same time, or for example, SiteSeq, which looks at um, proteins, so it looks at fluorescent staining for some antibodies as well as trans, um, trans, uh, the transcriptome at the same time. And really both single cell RNA sequencing and single cell attack sequencing have come very far from their conception. I already said this, but I want to tell you why, this, why there has been such an exponential increase in the number of cells that we can look at. And I think this has, something, it has much to do with the invention of microfluidics um, for, um, for the forcing a cell sequencing. And as you can see, like really the protocols that are using microfluidics like 10X um, genomics and DropSeq are the ones that produce the most amount um, of uh, cells. And um, this is, we have also seen a similar trend in single cell attack seek um, data, but obviously much faster. Um, this immense increase in throughput has led to three main computational challenges. Because modern studies include more and more cells, this means we probably have multiple individuals in studies, multiple batches, and varied experimental conditions. And while this is really good for scientific conclusions, because hopefully those will make our, our conclusions more robust, it also has the potential, uh, it also has the but also have, means we have to deal with this added variance from um, these multiple batches and have to account for these things. With increasing um, study sizes, we also have more complexity um, because we can look at um, we can look at more cells. That means we can look at more complex um, systems and actually be able to find all the cell populations inside. So for example, the human brain is a good example where really with the increasing um, study size, we have been able to see more and more um, sort of granularity in the cell types. Um, and finally, this is kind of obvious, more cells means bigger data. And um, this is really something that computational tools struggle with because they have to deal with this increase in size. Um, these three computational challenges have really driven um, the tool development in the area. And to this date, we have 738 tools that are specific for single cell um, analysis. And um, obviously 738 is a crazy amount and um, it's 
hard for anyone to pick the right tool. So this is why I think it's a good idea to just kind of give you an overview of the workflows and maybe hint to some of the tools that I'm using in my analysis. All right, I'm going to start with single cell um, RNA sequencing. Okay, before I want to go into the steps of the workflow, I want to point out that there are really only three questions that single cell RNA seq data can answer. Um, the first is what cell populations are in any of my samples? Um, the second is what developmental trajectories or how are these cell populations related? And the third is, is there a difference between um, two conditions, either of experimental nature or of a phenotype nature? And it's really important to acknowledge that these are the only three questions most studies will ever be able to answer because a lot of people have this conception that with single cell data, there was, would be this new revolution in all these questions that we can answer. And really, no, we can't answer everything. It's only these three things that can ever be addressed. All right, so to be able to get to these three endpoints, you actually have to have put a lot of steps in before. So like with most omics data, the massive amount of work is actually getting from the raw data to some sort of like pre-processed state where um, you can start answering the questions. So for single cell RNA-seq, this involves getting the raw sequencing data into a count matrix first. Um, and for a lot of the commercial tools like 10X genomics, you will have um, software for this specifically. If you're using more homebrew methods like um, SmartSeq, you're going to have to um, actually do this step yourself. And you can use great tools like SCPipe or Yumi tools for this step. Um, once you have the count matrices, what you want to do is do very stringent quality control. You want to remove um, cells that don't that are not actually cells, but that are just ambient RNA floating around. Um, you want to remove doublets, so any cells where you have actually two cells rather than just one cell. And um, you want to potentially do batch correction or sort of a data integration step whereby you um, remove any uh, any technical effects due to the fact that you have multiple individuals, multiple batches in um, your data set. Um, and I'll talk about this later. And once you are at this point, you're going to do um, a dimension reduction step. So this is where you are um, getting the data into a form where you can where you reduce its dimensionality drastically. And um, this has the advantage that you can start visualizing it in two dimensions or three dimensions. And you can also, you're also removing a lot of the technical noise here. Um, for this, you typically use a principal components analysis. And then for the tech, for the more visualization steps, you use um, further reduction dimensions that um, are on top of the principal components analysis, such as UMAP. After this um, comes the clustering on the principal components. And um, then you want to identify what your clusters are. Um, and hopefully at that point, you are at one of the endpoints. and You know what is in your sample or in your samples. And then you can do um, a trajectory inference or a comparison of conditions. And I will talk about all of these steps in more detail. All right, first though, this, is, this might seem like a pretty long sort of workflow, but you don't need to worry because there are actually great software toolkits and ecosystems that really help you out in being able to implement this. And the three main ones are Bioconductor, Surat, and Scampi. So Bioconductor and Surat are both in um, R, and Scampi is the Python native workflow. All of these three um, ecosystems are really, really well documented, have great manuals, and are really easy for beginners to pick up. And I particularly want to mention the Bioconductor um, book that was, um, that had, was written by um, Aaron and Stephanie and other people. And that is really, really wonderful to, like, for beginners to get, to get started with their analysis and explains every step really, really carefully. All right, I'm going to um, focus on Bioconductor in my talk um, because that's what I use and that's what I would recommend because I think it's it's the best it has the best manual in my opinion and that's that's a big thing um, this pipeline consists of many different packages 
that are actually making up this ecosystem. The most important though is the single cell experiment package. And this is the class, it's a package that builds a class, um, sort of an object where um, you can, which um, stores your single cell RNA seq information. So all of the data that you have and that you can manipulate in your analysis um, in order to actually get to sort of the three endpoints that we talked about. And so for anyone who is really like considering working with this bioconductor ecosystem, I would, con I would very, very strongly recommend looking into the single cell experiment package and really starting to understand the single cell experiment class that is so fundamental to this workflow um, and creating two grips with this. All right, but this is not what I'm here for. What I want to talk about is um, sort of the things that are highlighted in the workflow. And the first one is data integration. So data integration is becoming more and more important because when we first started, most people were only able to do sort of one um, single cell RNA-seq data set, but now most of us are able to do several. And that's really where, you know, you get starting to see sort of reproducible results. Um, when you have multiple, um, multiple samples, it's really important to do a batch correction. Um, and in particular, if you have other technical effects that might be, um, might also be uh, in, in your analysis. And here I have an example where I had um, two different um, protocols, 10X protocols, version two and version three. And I was trying, and I had several samples from version two and version three, and I was trying to integrate those samples. What you can see here is that if you don't do any batch correction, what you get is clusters that are either version two or either version three, it's pretty much exclusively, but you don't get nicely mixed clusters. So you are seeing, so you're seeing that the technical um, variance starts dominating your analysis. Um, what I like to do when I am confronted with a problem like that is that I just like to rescale, um, so regress out my very severe batch effect, and that actually results in pretty nice um, sort of mixed clusters later on as you can see here. Um, but this is a pretty aggressive um, correction and um, it can actually lead, lead to um, you losing information that you might be interested in. So for example, consider um, this study where we had samples coming in from multiple stages of development. And if you use an approach like this rescaling approach that I just talked about, what you would get is you would lose this um, this uh, developmental, uh, the, these developmental stages, and you would have them all um, integrate nicely, but you wouldn't have this, this development in your data set any longer. Um, and what we've, what we've come up with, or Ch um, Chuck has come up with, he's a really talented postdoc in my lab, and he's come up with uh, using downsampling. And this might sound sort of counterintuitive at first because we think of downsampling as throwing away information. And while that's true, it turns out that it's really, really good at um, preserving this biological variance of interest whilst sort of being a gentle batch correction and, um, but still being able to integrate the samples nicely. And you can see this um, here. Uh, okay, so the next step I want to focus on is clustering. So clusters can be obtained by very many different um, approaches and the approaches, uh, the approach you use for clustering is typically not that important. It's way more important that you think about how many clusters you actually want to end up with. And this is something that can never be determined from the data itself because um, it has to come from your biological knowledge. This is your resolution. So the number of clusters that you want to end up with is actually completely determined by um, the biological system that you're working with. So one way of um, doing this is that you start actually over clustering, producing too many clusters in your data set, and then using um, cluster annotation in order to start naming what the clusters are and potentially putting some clusters back together, merging clusters. Um, for this automatic cluster annotation can help, but it does never replace a human. So I like using single R, which is also in the bioconductor ecosystem, um, but, it, but really what it comes down to is, is again this human aspect of annotating clusters. And for this, what I, I collaborate with biologists and 
I like to use um, interactive tools in order to make this um, feasible. For example, um, I see in the bioconductor universe makes these wonderful little shiny apps that you can share with your biologists. The next one of the next end points is trajectory analysis. So trajectory analysis um, is the idea of inferring um, bio, uh, inferring how um, cells are related. And again, this is you need biological knowledge to interpret this and actually determine whether this is makes sense at all. So here in this example of Aridopsis, it makes sense because we know that the root tip develops from the bottom up and that there is actual development in the system. But it doesn't make sense to apply trajectory analysis in a system that is completely... Oh. Sorry, don't know what happened there. That, that is already um, that is already there where there is no development like um, the human brain. Um, there are different approaches to how to do trajectory analysis. Some that work on gene expression, while others um, work on the idea of the ratio between exons and introns. And I would always um, suggest using them in concert. All right. Um, finally, one of the other endpoints that we have is um, uh, comp is uh, comparing two conditions. And when you do this, what you need to remember is that when you do this naively by using all the cells, what you would actually end up with is p-values that are way, way, way too optimistic. And this was pointed out in a wonderful review by Crowell and Al. And uh, what they suggested was to use pseudo-bulking, where for every in every cluster, you sum um, the sum for every sample, all the cells in that particular cluster, and then you can just um, use typical bulk RNA seq methods like LIMA and HR to compare compare conditions. And this has been shown to be really effective in order to um, get not optimistic p values, um, and it's also super super fast. All right, finally, I want to talk uh, briefly about visualizations because these are often an after results in these software packages. So for example, I want you to look at um, these two pictures of the same data set. And the only difference in, the state, in these data sets is that they were ordered differently. So the data order here is by decreasing CD19 expression, whereas in, on the right-hand side, it's by increasing CD19 expression. So here you wouldn't know that this middle cluster is a B cell population, while here that's pretty clear. So obviously this overplotting of points becomes a problem, especially when you have a millions of millions of cells. So I developed SC hex, which um, summarizes cells um, or data points in the same region, so in these hexagonal regions, and then gives you the mean value. Um, and you can install this via Bioconductor as well. And SC-HEX is wonderful because it works, again, with your single cell experiment class, but as well as with Surat. And so you can integrate it really easily into your workflows. All right. So I have given some recommendations for tools that I use, but I, instead of me telling you exactly what you should use, the best way of actually for you to get into this is to look at benchmarking studies. So benchmarking studies compare different methods um, on a range of data sets and then try, you to, try to give you recommendations. So in 2018, um, I published a benchmarking studies on the comparison of different clustering algorithms. Um, and then a year later, we did, um, in collaboration with a wonderful, P at the time, PhD student, Louis Tian, we um, did a comparison of loads of different um, steps of the single cell RNA-seq um, pipeline. But these are not the only benchmarking um, papers. There are heaps of benchmarking papers that are all really, really useful. And I have compiled a list here that I'm very happy to share. All right, now then um, single cell attack seek. So just um, a reminder, single cell attack seek tries to measure open chromatin and um, by using TN5. And basically, you pull down anything that is not bound by histones um, and you get reads. And if these reads have these wonderful peaks, you know that this is um, an open chromatin region. If you do this in 
uh, single cells, the data that you get is extremely sparse because this is a genome-wide technology. And this sparseness is one of the main problems in the analysis of single cell ataxic data. Um, this is the, the workflow for single cell ataxic data is still pretty much an active area of research, but it is in a way similar to what we have seen for single cell RNA seq data. So, what you do is again, you get a count matrix, you do some quality control, you do a dimension reduction, but here instead of using PCA, you keep the sparseness in mind, and um, people have thought that it's actually better to use um, latent semantic indexing, which is um, a method that comes from document um, research. And, but you again get the same type of output where you have um, a noise reduction um, as well as um, you, you're able to visualize um, the data. Then you go into clustering and at that point you want to do peak calling and then you can get to um, a couple of different endpoints where either you do transcription factor binding or um, marker identification or again a compositional analysis, so comparing two different um, conditions. I like to use RCHAR for uh, my single cell ataxy. This is unfortunately not in the bioconductor universe, but it is in R. Um, and I like using it because it's extremely fast. It's extremely memory efficient. That's very important because of these data sets are really, really large. Um, and it gives you all these endpoints that I just talked about pretty seamlessly. And it also comes with an extremely helpful manual. However, while I'm largely very happy with Archer, there are a couple of computational challenges that really remain to be addressed. So first, it's quite hard to judge the quality of a data set um, from just, from just um, the sort of quality control measures. Um, then it's uh, the lower, it, it almost always seems to have lower resolution in single cell RNA-seq data. And that could be because of its sparsity um, and also because um, we typically do annotation with single cell RNA-seq data at this point. And this results in pretty unconvincing peaks, in my opinion, that you later see. Um, and this could also be because we're still using bulk peak callers at the moment in order to do this. So there's still a lot to be done here. All right, so in summary, well, you need to, workflows really need to be adapted for every study that you're doing. You should, because there's so many tools out there, you should really document your workflow very, very well and be able to defend decisions that you make. Um, it's very helpful to learn from all the benchmarking efforts that are out there, certainly helped me in my analysis. And um, interactive tools are very, very helpful to communicate with collaborators. And finally, biological knowledge is really the integral part of interpreting single cell RNA-seq results. And without it, you're kind of not going to get anywhere. So with that, I just want to thank um, everyone in my lab, everyone in the Ritchie lab, and um, people in the Lockhart and the Barlow lab um, for supplying data or um, helping with um, computational workflows. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, so here's the questions. Uh, one question is, uh, so everybody feel free to um, have your questions um, put in the chat box. Um, here's one from, um, Adam Young. I can see the one from Tom. Yeah. yeah. So Tom asks, which tools algorithms do you use for batch correction? So I actually use, um, I, I, I just use um, rescaling approach that is available in Scran or in Bachelor now. Um, and that seems to work fine for me. There's also a downsampling approach in Bachelor. So I use that. And then I also found BBKNN, which is available in Python quite useful because it's pretty gentle as well. Yeah, so there's another question about SC-HEX and whether SC-HEX um, has an interactive plot. Yes, SC-HEX has an interactive plot. Um, there are quite a couple of interactive capabilities in SC-HEX um, that help you with selecting um, your bin sizes because you can determine how many points in a region you want to summarize. So that's um, 
what you can do. So there's another question on downsampling. So downsampling is simply the idea whereby you randomly select the number of um, cell, the num you randomly select reads that you discard until every cell has the same number of reads. So you have to go until your lowest, the, your, your smallest cell that you try to keep inside. So it's, um, okay, what about time? There's Another question, maybe last question, if any. Otherwise, we'll but there's one more question. Is if there's a specific, is only measured in one batch, is it possible to remove the batch? So if, I mean, obviously you have to have smart experimental design. If you are, if your batch effect is completely um, the same as your condition, then it's going to be really, really tough to remove it. And then I think probably the best you can do is try to use downsampling, but this, uh, you know, good statistical, ex good experimental design is, is the be and all, and you will never be able to solve these with statistical methods.